Hey there, Tisha Rose here, founder of Hurdle to Hope, host of Wellbeing Interrupted podcast. And I'm very excited to be interviewed by Prosper on the online prosperity show. In it, we'll be sharing a bit of my background because it is my hope that if your life is ever interrupted by an unexpected hurdle, that you learn to use your mindset to have an impact on your experience. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to yet another exciting episode of the Online Prosperity Show, where we dive deep into stories of resilience, triumph, and secrets to success. I'm your host, Prosper Tarovinga, and today we're about to embark on a journey that promises to be nothing short of extraordinary. Now, we have the remarkable Tisha with us in the studio. Tisha, how are you doing today? Very well. Thanks for the intro, Prosper. Fantastic. Well, we haven't even started yet, and I uh, I can't wait, um, you know, to hear your story and your experiences because uh, I I do know there will be a light of hope for other people out there. Now, for those that are at the back of the room and haven't heard of Tisha, well, let me take you out of your misery because um, joining us, uh, like I said, is Tisha Rose, who is a powerhouse behind well-being interrupted and it's the ingenious mind that is driving hurdle to hope and Tisha's story is one of unwavering strength and transformative power of mindset as she herself is navigating um you know life with ms and a stage four breast cancer now i want you to get ready to be inspired because i think this episode is shaping up to be one of the best we've had in a very very long time now, Tisha, thank you so much for being on the show with us today. Could you You're maybe welcome. share with our audience who you are and what it is that you do in your own words? Yeah, and I get asked this a lot and there's so much, I guess, to my background, but I like sharing it in terms of two really pivotal moments that have defined my life. One back when I was 25. I woke up one morning and I was hitting something in my bed. I couldn't work out what it was. And my stomach dropped when I realized I was punching my leg. I couldn't feel it. I couldn't move my other leg. And you see, three years before that moment, I was diagnosed as a 22-year-old with MS. I'd just finished university, two degrees, a business degree, a degree in psychology, also had started my career at Telstra on their graduate program. So life was going perfectly to plan. I was experiencing some relapses with MS, nothing too much until this very moment. And so 2000 was a defining moment and year for me because I spent months and months in hospital. And I say I spent months paralyzed physically. At times, I couldn't even wriggle my toes. I couldn't get out of bed. So that opens up a whole new level of dependency for someone who's only 25. But I was also emotionally paralyzed because I'd never experienced anything like this. And I was out of depth. I had no idea what to do to get through this. And it was pivotal because my life from this moment was no longer on automatic pilot. I was no longer living the life I assumed would be mine. So I know after this time, when I regained mobility and I got out of a wheelchair, I returned to work and I was sitting in my office at Telstra and thinking, is this job worth um, getting so sick for? And it was a clear, no, it wasn't. So I then started living a completely different life. I travelled overseas in 2001 by myself and lived in Scotland. I um, came back and had a career change. I went to a regional town and studied social work and ended up working with um, people experiencing homelessness in regional Victoria I went back overseas, I volunteered in Romania, I met my life partner. So all of these amazing things happened all because of that moment in 2000. And life was going well. You know, I haven't had a relapse with MS since 2012. 
and my life is unrecognizable. I've moved, I've lived um, and moved to the sea um, side. So, and um, with my beautiful partner, Andrew, and, and life was great. I was just about to launch a new business called Hurdle to Hope, about to launch a course helping people with MS and using their mindset to get through the challenges. And then another defining moment in 2022, I'll take you to a phone call I received and it was of um, a phone call from my surgeon. You see, a couple of weeks before I was diagnosed with stage two breast cancer, totally unexpected like MS. I thought I had my disease for this lifetime, but I thought, okay, I'll cope with this. It's stage two. It means I can have a mastectomy and it will be okay. You know, it's, um, there's a cure, you know, I can get rid of the cancer. Packing my bag, ready for my actual surgery. The surgeon called and said, I'm so sorry, but the surgery is cancelled. Your tumour is actually no longer contained to your breast. It has spread to your liver and also up here on my sternum. I've never felt such fear. You know, when I was diagnosed with MS, my stomach was knotted. I was a bit scared, but I was in complete free fall. You know, I hung up the phone and I gasped for air. I was so scared because... Stage four breast cancer, you hear about stage four cancer. It's referred to advanced metastasized terminal cancer. And that was now what I was dealing with. And I was petrified by what that meant. And it was, I had a four day days of before I saw an oncologist to work out my treatment plan. And that was most harrowing four days I've ever experienced in my life. But I also realised that all of these insights I've gained in living with MS, I was able to apply to that. So I knew things like don't hop on Google, don't search secondary cancer, you know, stay away from that. Speak to people who hold you and uplift you, who don't add to your fear and anxiety. And when I went to the oncologist, I felt very calm I was very composed. I'd spent four days crying, so my tears <laughs> weren't there at that moment. And I felt like I was in control. I felt like, okay, MS, cancer, completely different conditions. Perhaps I'm lucky <laughs> to have both. But everything I've learned in 25 years in living with MS, I was able to bring that to the table in dealing with breast cancer. So there... That's me, I guess, in terms of the extremes of what's happened. There's been heaps in between. Um, but at the moment, I feel my life's not defined by my illnesses, but there's certainly significant events that have happened to me. Wow. And, and thank you so much for sharing that with us there, Tisha, because I, I don't think this has been easy um in in all of this well you know at the time when this all started you had your life fully ahead of you you had just finished college and you were pretty much ready to sort of get started now what was what was life like prior to age 22 what what what, what was the dream and the childhood experience yeah so before 22, I was very studious. I went to a really academic high school um, and, you know, really pushed myself um, to get good marks. It was just a given, not from pressure from home, but I just wanted to go to university. All my friends were doing that. Um, so I went and did two degrees, you know, I did a double degree in Bachelor of Business Management, Bachelor of Arts Psychology. And I then applied for graduate programs and I was so excited because I got into Telstra I started my career in sort of training and development. Um, so, yeah, everything was going completely to plan. I was living in the city, Melbourne. I was surrounded by, you know, what you do in your 20s and having fun and, and living life and living the life I'd assume would be mine. So when I was diagnosed, it didn't really sink in until all of a sudden I was having difficulties with mobility and I was very reactive 
if I all of a sudden couldn't work, walk properly, straight away I would call my doctor, go into hospital maybe for a couple of days of steroid treatment, get out, go back to work and continue on until the next um, occurrence of a relapse. So I wasn't proactively looking after my health. I mean, I was a healthy person, but for me it was very reactive um, approach. So, yeah, so it really took me to absolutely be paralysed to really stop me and work out what to do. That's really difficult when you're, I realise now, it's difficult and when you're surrounded by sameness. So I was very much, everyone around me had the same background, the same aspirations for their future. So, you know, I didn't know how to create a different life which would help me prioritise my well-being. So I was, you know, I was very frustrated by the impact MS was having on my dreams. Oh, absolutely, because, I mean, you had your whole life ahead of you. You still do. And uh, kudos for you to now, having navigated it, you're now sort of sending the elevator down for other people to also learn, um, you know, from your experiences. Now, you mentioned something that really stuck with me at age 25 you asked yourself the question is this job really worth getting sick for now yeah, yeah. is this a question that only tisha would have asked or is it something that so many people are going through in life and they just hoping somebody will tell them that answer yeah i think sometimes it takes a crisis to really put life in perspective like I talk about having a midlife crisis at 25 and it's really then living in alignment. It's saying, well, my health is a priority. I cannot, I don't want to spend months in hospital again. And then I did have further relapses later on, so I was a bit of a slow learner. But I kept saying, you know, my health is my priority, so what parts of my life do I need to change to live in alignment for that and my job at that time, it wasn't enabling me to prioritise my health. I was travelling a lot, doing training. I loved my job, but I was really pushing myself because I wanted promotions and I took a lot of self-worth that I think we do from our careers and our KPIs and promotions and all. So I really had to look differently about my job, you know, and think about what career can I have, which will enable me to prioritise my well-being. Fantastic. And pretty much from then on, the first thing that you did was to walk away and go as far away from everything you've ever known when you went to Scotland for the very first time. Tell me, what was the thought process in that? Or was that somewhat of an escape of what was actually happening? Or was that somehow you trying to figure out yourself um, in, in your own sort of way? Yeah, it was pretty intentional because friends were doing what lots of Aussie people in their 20s do, go over to the UK on working holidays. And I felt like I was being left behind. So I kept thinking... If I get out of the wheelchair, if I get moving again, then I don't want to miss out. I want to do this. But it was intentional to go by myself because I realised lying in a hospital bed, it was the first time I realised that we're truly alone in life, not meaning that I didn't have extremely supportive family and friends. I did. It was incredible, the support I had. But when you're hooked up to machines in a hospital, when you're in the middle of the night, unable to move, unable to wriggle your toes, you realise I'm in this life by myself and I need, if I'm never going to be scared of what's ahead of me down the track, I need to work out how can I tap into my inherent strengths, how can I develop more strengths to cope with that scenario so and I also didn't want the pressure of letting other people down so I thought if I go by myself what an amazing experience what a freeing experience and I you know let's see what I'm made of let's see how I cope with this and it was incredible best decision of my life I had amazing time and what I loved about it was 
I wasn't defined by MS. You know, I was defined by being having an Aussie accent. Um, you know, so it wasn't about they're like, where are you from? Not what have you got? So I was able to create distance from MS. And yeah, it was it was amazing. So I'm so pleased I did that at 26 because it really meant, yeah, it really changed my future. I like that because that's when you came and you had a totally different career, which essentially took you away from being the uh, the person that's looking after pretty much themselves, their career and, you know, promotions and the achievements that you would have gotten. But you started taking care of other people in a psychological space or in a, in, in a social sort of space. Would yes. you think that sort of really opened you up then to how when you're away from home, you literally depend on the village and the community to look after you. And when you came back, you wanted to sort of do that for others as well. Yeah, I think travelling puts life in perspective. You know, you sit every day looking at the Edinburgh Castle and you think, I am such a tiny blip in history, you know, and I'm not going to live my life defined and being angry about having MS. Yes, I've got it. No, I don't like it. But it is what it is. And it's like, I'm not going to let that define my life. I'm not going to be miserable about that. I'll do everything I can to be well. But yeah, so that changed my perspective. And then when I came home, I was going to move back to Melbourne and look for work. And I thought, no, I don't want to replicate my life and go back to old ways. So I then applied for university and went back to uni and studied social work um, and moved to a country town. I would never have done that, but I thought I've just lived in Scotland by myself. Why not? <laughs> you know, two hours up the road in Bendigo. I said, I can cope with that. So that was amazing. Again, like travelling, social work opened my world. So when I mentioned earlier, part of me not being able to cope with or work out what to do with MS was my life was so narrow and narrow in focus. Travelling opens up your world. Studying social work and working in emergency housing and working with people going through such trauma and so many different things in their life opens up your world as well. It's like we've all got something we're dealing with. Mine happens to be MS. Thank goodness I've got a secure home and loving family. Um, but other people have their own, um, you know, obstacles to overcome. So, again, doing social work opened my world again. So I went from customer service training to at one stage, you know, sitting in sand pits, working with kids from broken homes, you know, and doing things like that. I then ended up working as a housing supporter, support worker in a prison. You know, so my life changed so much, um, but I'm so pleased I had those experiences. Oh, absolutely. Because at the end of the day, when obviously you're young, you just really want to go through the motions, do the things, win mm -hmm. the awards, win the accolades, you know, uh, do exactly what society uh, sort of has prescribed, which is literally go to school, you know, go to university, get the job you want. And, you know, the, you know how the story sort of unfolds and um, yeah. which is not, which is what you then realized that that's not what was prescribed for you. But you took it upon yourself and you're like, you know what, I'm going to go and see the vampires myself because you went to Romania after that. And um, obviously Dracula is well known <laughs> for yes. being in Romania and uh obviously the brown bears and everything else, all oh, the food in Romania as well. And uh, you found the love of your life, didn't you, in the process? Was that Dracula himself? <laughs> no, he, he was when I got home. So what happened was I finished my social work degree um, and I thought, you know, let's go off on another adventure. Actually, towards the end of my social work degree, I had another massive relapse and I at that time couldn't use my arms and couldn't use my legs. So the level of dependency was nothing I'd ever experienced. Petrifying, you know, not being able to, I had to learn how to use cutlery right again. You know, it was really intense. 
And I realized I had slipped back in prioritizing my well-being in working. I was doing the same as I was at Telstra. I was pushing myself. I was letting slip all these things I had learned about prioritizing my well-being. So I had another relapse. I then came back, went to, you know, finished my social work degree. And I thought, right, what are we going to do this time? And I didn't want to just travel and do temping work. I wanted something with a bit more meaning. And at the time, my dad was working at World Vision Australia or internationally, and he met with someone who they were running a day centre in a town called Craiova in Romania, sort of west of Bucharest. Um, And they said they'd love to have me over there. So I spent about three or four months um, in Craiova in a day centre for kids who had previously been institutionalised with special needs in orphans. Uh, orphanages and it was an amazing experience Um, and I got to see what others working as physios, social workers, educators did in a completely different culture Um, and the irony wasn't lost on me. You know, I was helping physios teach young kids to walk again and I was thinking this is what I'm faced with as well and there's these beautiful kids who don't have much in their life at all but do have loving families or foster parents and the laughter and the energy in this center was amazing so yeah so I did that I then came home again thought I'd return to Melbourne and I thought no I'll I'll go back to Bendigo and yeah, that's when I met my Dracula. <laughs> it's not Dracula, um, but that's when I met Andrew. Um, I returned to, have you got time for me to share the story of how I met Andrew? Absolutely. absolutely. Yeah, so Andrew, um, I went back and I thought I'm over, you know, you get over house sharing um, and all. So I thought I'd love to rent somewhere by myself or even buy a unit happened that um, I bought a one-bedroom unit. I would never have done that living in, um, working at Telstra, but I'd just been to homes in Romania of whole families living in one-bedroom units. And I thought, I'm single, I'm by myself, you know, one bedroom's fine with me and it will be mine. So I was so excited about doing that. I was on the phone to a girlfriend um, that night when I moved in and I said to her, right, I've just turned 30. I said, I've done all the travel, career change and all. I said, it's right to meet someone. I said, but how am I ever going to meet anyone? I was like, I can't go out to, you know, pubs or whatever because it's just too hard standing and I don't drink alcohol because with MS and all, I've, you know, aren't able to really for what was a choice I've made. And so, you know, that was our conversation as girlfriends have. Next morning, open the door to a horrendous smell, and I'm thinking, what's going on? The sewer outlet out the front of the six units was overflowing. I went out and a lovely plumber was walking up the driveway and that plumber was, um, I immediately sensed a connection with, um, and that was Andrew, Um, and he hung around for a few days, fixing all the um, drains and all. And I remember coming home, I was out on the Friday, came home and thought, mama has gone, he was such a nice guy. And I sat on my bed and said, if it's meant to be, it will be. Girlfriend and I went out that night, another girlfriend, for dinner, went to a restaurant we usually go to, it was full, walked around the corner. Sitting outside the restaurant was the beautiful plumber, Andrew, and our paths crossed that night, and we've been together ever since. Oh, fantastic. That is such a beautiful uh, story right there because, you know, what I, I viscerally believe the universe always conspires to get us that which we want, um, yeah. you know, and obviously that episode of you just having your you know, uh, plumbing issues. And then Andrew shows up into the space and yeah. you guys have been together ever since. Yeah. Yeah. That's 19 years ago. So yeah. So he's, he's amazing. And yeah, it's exactly who I need to, um, yeah, be on this life journey with. 
I I really, really value that. Now, just in case Andrew is watching right <laughs> now, what what would you want to say to him that you've probably never said before? Yeah, and, I mean, we do. We're very open. What's good about having why I never met who I was meant to be with in South Bank and in that corporate world is I've got someone who's so grounded, so down to earth, and we have such open communication. And I wouldn't get through what I'm going through without Andrew, but it's also we call ourselves a not quite right couple because Andrew's had mental health issues over the years and cognitively I've been fine. And then he's like, so we're like, my head's not right, your legs or whatever, and now he's like, and now, you know, your chest, but together we're all right. And, you know, we complete each other and um, we're very, I wouldn't, get through what I've been through and it's the humour he brings to situations where we'll be talking and crying with a doctor. The surgeon, I'll give you this example. The surgeon um, we met when we were talking about that my cancer returned and, you know, the mastectomy was back on the table so I ended up having one June this year just gone. And as Andrew said to the um surgeon is like, Tish, with her two boobs in an urn on the mantelpiece, no good to me. He's like, chop them off. And he said, and then let's just get on with that life. And that's the the realness you need in such a crisis. It's like, let's just cut through all the BS and let's just cut through and really work out what's important. And that's what it was important. Um, so, yeah, I've been through this and raw emotions at times but also knowing that I can get through it with him by my side uh, well on behalf of everybody else that's watching this uh, Andrew you're a legend um, mm -hmm. it's things and it's people like yourself that we need more of now you've gone on and obviously really started helping other people to have perspective as to where they are you know, where they're at in life, you know, in most people, and I'm going to say this with almost love and respect that are going through stuff in life. The hardest thing that would have gone through, you know, because of how good the medical system is in, in, in Australia, is probably the, the loss of a nail or the loss of an eyelash. I was joking yeah, about yeah. that earlier on. And, and maybe, you know, some people that have actually gone through the last couple of years through the pandemic, you know, would have now started realizing, wait a minute, life could actually turn around in another way. But you've gone through these two, even though they're distinct conditions, each and every one of them, if you're handed, you know, as a normal person, that will yeah. literally leave you flat on the ground. Um, but you've really reaffirmed one truth that in living with a life-changing illness, your mindset is everything. Maybe you yeah. could just touch up on that because from what you're saying, yes, you're going through all of these things, but you still would go um, to Scotland and marvel at, you know, the creations there. That yeah. takes a yeah. redemptive amount of selflessness to start thinking, you know what? I'm minuscule in the grand scheme of things. And you looking at the kids in Romania, um, you know, it actually really gave you a bit of perspective there. So um, how important has mindset been throughout uh, all of these uh, experiences for you? Incredibly important. I don't think I had, I'm a lot clearer about what I mean now by mindset. So I think early on with MS, I don't think I was authentic to the trauma I was going through. I was certainly positive, but I was scared to be authentic of through the grief and the fear and, um, yeah, the unknown that I was going through. So I didn't know. I thought if I feel these emotions, that makes me negative and I didn't want to be negative. So Breast cancer has taught me that we need to be authentic with our mindset. You know, we need to be authentic in feeling the feelings. 
but we can still have a positive mindset or outlook. So that's been pivotal over the last year for me to work through because I have been so scared and I don't want anyone to think going through what I've gone through, I've just got through it. Like I've had so much fear about what these tumours meant, but by exploring that, that emotion and that fear, I haven't ever deviated from having a positive outlook. And so I've got authenticity with positivity. Um, and I know that I can have an impact every step of the way. And that's what I work with people about because it's not about just being positive and saying, yep, you'll be right, stay strong, fight the fight. You know, it's about exploring your emotions, but it's about you know, being true to those emotions, but realising that there is so much we can do with our mindset to have an impact. Healing can happen from the very moment a doctor tells you you have a terminal illness because you can do things in that moment to protect your emotional well-being. You know, you can stop you can stop your mind from wondering in that moment of, you know, um imagining all the possible catastrophes that might be part of your future. So there's so much we can do with our mind in every situation. Um, and that's what's the silver lining, I guess, when we go through things. It's like the common denominator in life is no matter what situation we're in, our mindset's with us. So that mindset can become our greatest enemy or it can become our greatest ally. And that's what I do. And that's why I've coped with both of the illnesses. Mm, I quite like that because I think there's a statement, I can't quite remember who it comes from, that um, I used to, you know, curse the fact that I did not have shoes up until I met a man who did not have feet. And a lot of people just look at their own scenario and realize, oh, woe is me. But you yeah. now help people kiss goodbye to all this everyday stress, anxiety, the fear, and you actually help them create um, a healthier and happier, more balanced life um, and, and literally give them back their confidence. Now, what is it then that inspired you to create Hurdle to Hope, um, which is Wellness Interrupted? Yeah, so... Um, there's two things of what I'm doing. So the wellbeing interrupted part is my podcast, which I've just started, and then Hurdle to Hope's my business. Um, and Hurdle to Hope is based on the Hurdle to Hope roadmap because I guess what's really motivated me now more than ever is realising that, as we mentioned, two completely different um, diseases, you know, in cancer and MS, but you still can apply the same mindset shifts to navigate each of them. And that's what I've done. And it, I guess too, I think even starting my career at Telstra in training and development, working as a social worker, I'm now bringing all of those skills and insights into my own business. And I think, well, there's a reason you know, it's it's great getting to a point in your life where you think, wow, that makes sense. You know, I, I can train people because that's what I learned to do in my 20s or I can work with people going through such scary times because that's what I did as a social worker. And so now I'm more motivated than ever because I know more than ever that using your mindset and following the Hurdle to Hope roadmap will help you look forward with confidence and I used to be concerned thinking people will see me using a walker, for example, which I've started to use and because of risk of falls after my mastectomies, I didn't want to fall. Um, and I thought people will look at me and think, well, how can she talk about hope? How can she talk about healing? Because look at her, <laughs> her legs are, you know, they're not working properly. And it's like, no, it's like challenging that and thinking healing happens at such a level of mind, body and spirit, you know, and whatever happens to me with cancer, with MS, I know I can have an impact on that. 
and I've got two extreme diseases. You know, I've got stage four breast cancer. Although it's a sleep, I get kept been told, you know, it's incurable. It can come back at any time. I know as soon as it comes back, I can have an impact on that, whatever my future is. So, yeah, that's what I'm so excited to share with other people because I know firsthand the fear and anxiety you experience going through health conditions, health crises, and I just want to share my insights to make that easier for others. Mm, and good on you for being very selfless because, as we keep saying, somebody will be like, oh, i got to look after myself. I have to um, obviously, yeah, make sure that I seemingly feel better, get better or whatever, alleviate the pain, which leaves you to become selfish, whereas you're actually sending the elevator down for others to actually uh, be elevated. And you're really helping people to reclaim their lives because at the end of the day, you know, once you are in that sort of position, the least you want to be is negative because like you say, all the healing starts in the mindset. You can be walking with a walker just for support, but your brain is still very functional. It's not in a walker. It's actually uh, helping you be. So who specifically how, uh, benefits from this um, Hurdle to Hope uh, roadmap and uh, how is it that it actually helps them? Yeah, so the Hurdle to Hope roadmap is, I'll take it back a step. I, when I turned 40, I promised myself I'd write a book, um, and I did. It was called Life Interrupted, um, My Journey from Hurdle to Hope. And in that, I shared um, the story of me. This was published in 2015, so this is pre-cancer. Um, and the first was about my story, you know, with MS, some of the things we've chatted about. And then the second half I didn't want it just to be about me. I wanted it to be, and I think this is my social work psychology background, I wanted it to be a tool to help others face with their own challenges. So I presented six stages that I recognised in reflecting the stages I've moved through from hurdle to hope, and they were represented by the acronym HEALTH. Hurdle, engagement, where you're fixated on your condition, um, then the agitation, your emotional response about life has changed forever, not happy about that. Then the letting go, like I talked about, prioritising your health and well-being, living in alignment. And then the taking time, the pivotal moment where you actually challenge everything you think about um, in relation to your life, you know, really challenging your frame of reference. And then the hope, which happens when you're no longer defined by your illness. So I presented all of that and lots of people, great feedback from the book. And it's like, yeah, but we want to apply it to our own life. So that's what I did. I learned how to put together an online course that was ready to go for MS when I was diagnosed with breast cancer. So I had to put all of that on hold. Um, but what's happened is I've used that course and all the activities and all of the insights in dealing with breast cancer. So I'm more confident than ever it works um, because the outcome from my cancer has been so positive. You know, I mentioned before the call, I'm now officially in remission from my cancer. And when I said that to my neurologist, he said, yeah, you're in remission from your MS as well. And he said, amazing, two massive diseases, both in remission. And I know it's all of the work I've done. So that's why I'm so want to share it, but share it in a consumable way. So that's why I've created the Healing Mindset course based on that roadmap. That's why, and that's for people living with a life-changing illness. I also supplement that if a person wants with a um, six-week coaching program. But I also want to... Part of supporting those living with the condition is also doing workshops for practitioners and for support people. And I can do that seeing, you know, I'm a social worker, you know, so that gives me credibility also in that space. And it's like, how can you work with people intentionally to help them move forward from hurdle to hope? Um, so, yeah, so that's what I'm doing, sort of two branches of that and plus my podcast. 
So, yeah, so I'm busy, but good. That's fantastic. And uh, I don't know if congratulations is the word for this because obviously, you know, these two monsters have sort of given you a bit of a break for us yeah. to have you on the show and you to actually create what you're creating. So whatever you're doing, keep um, doing it because it does seem to be uh, working. And I feel like if you then start expanding and expanding yourself to help other people, it takes away the you know the in, in, internal look to say why me and um why now whereas now you're saying hey i need to actually go out there there's people that are waiting to hear from me and and i, I had a bit of a look at uh, your book it's actually a book um that if somebody's going to be reading it yes like you said it is a story about yourself but I think it's more than a life story it is actually a book that is designed to encourage people to re-examine what's actually holding them back um you know from fulfilling their own hopes and dreams and um I can't thank you enough for giving us that gift um you know that a lot of people might not have the opportunity to go through what you're going through but they can actually walk the journey with you and that's how a lot of people would learn so how can individuals maybe reach out to you if they're interested in learning more about either the hurdle to hope or well-being uh interrupted yeah yeah so my podcast well-being interrupted that comes out weekly um and that's on anywhere you listen to podcasts so um yeah so that's all happening then my website is hurdle to number two hope so hurdle to hope.com and on that there's a couple of ways that you can you know start there's the hurdle to hope um if you go hurdle to hope.com forward slash masterclass there's the reclaim your life on demand masterclass that really goes into the three situations everyone will experience in living with an illness in terms of the crisis in terms of um, the emotional turmoil and the new beginnings. And I'd share the three mindset shifts which will help you to navigate each of these situations. I'm also um, putting together, and it will be on the website, I've, I've got to finish it tonight, so it'll be there by the time this comes out, um, a quiz. And it's called the Healing Journey Quiz. And I encourage people to do that because no matter where you are on your journey, as I mentioned earlier, you can start healing as soon as you walk out of a doctor's office. There are things you can do to protect your emotional well-being from that very first day. And that's what I want to share. And so that quiz will help me learn where you are and what we need to do with you to help you to keep moving forward. And I think it's interesting too, um, Prosper, you mentioned before about, you know, thinking, why me? And I think why I'm driven with this is I think it's me for a reason. You know, I think that whatever your beliefs are, I've had these experiences, but I've also had the grounding and the, you know, the background in my studies and in my career that enables me to make sense of all of this and to put it into consumable bites, I guess, through the roadmap that will help other people. So my hope for the future, how amazing would it be to have a hurdle to hope actual app, you know, that people lying in a hospital bed thinking, okay, what do I need to do? What should I do to get me through tonight? What do I do to get me through those you know, lying in an MRI machine or whatever it is. So there's so much we can do. And if I can reach people to share, you know, to save them from some of the angst and some of the absolute fear I went through, then I feel like I'm living my purpose. Fantastic. I virtually believe we're here in life to leave, to learn and to contribute. So in order for us to live the best life possible, we need to learn either from our own experiences or other people's experiences, um, you know, throughout. And then once we figure it out, these first two, we need to send the elevator down and contribute to others so they too can be, do and have 
a happier existence. And yeah. you are, you know, saying you help people to kiss goodbye, everyday stress, uh, fear and anxiety. Um, I, I think you're doing God's work. So that that is amazing. Now, I'll make sure I put all the links um, in the show mm -hmm. notes there. Right. That way people can get a hold of you and actually get started because I like the idea of the app because you did mention even though you've got people around you um they still got to go back home they still got to you know look after other yeah. um you know people as well so there's times and moments when you're actually literally yeah. by yourself and i think the app is going to be that saving grace that uh, a lot of people would need um moving forward so yeah that's yeah. a so that's a that's a project a project for later in the year <laughs> <laughs> absolutely it's a pity uh andrew only works on pipes and uh plumbing he could have been <laughs> <laughs> no but here's the exciting thing and why i'm so excited about we like the change from living in a city then the sea change we actually after i was diagnosed it's like what do we want to do and it's like i don't want to go traveling anymore like i that wasn't i wanted to heal and i knew i didn't want to I didn't need other experiences to gain perspective. We bought 100 acres of land in um, central Victoria. So Andrew's at the moment up there building sheds and he'll do the house and all, and that's where we're going to live. And I'm so excited about my future. Who knows what's going to happen cancer-wise or MS-wise, but I know that I'm in the right place for my healing. And this new experience of living off the grid um, and, you know, living on 100 acres surrounded by nature. So I'm so excited. And that's what the 20, I wish I could tell the 25-year-old self who was so upset about losing my career in customer service training, now approaching 50, I'm going to be living off the grid, immersed in nature and healing and helping others. So, yeah, life takes you in different turns, but I'm very happy with where I am. Fantastic. No, I, I'm really pleased and happy with what we've created here today. And I think, you know, you've taken that hurdle that a lot of people have and you've neatly packaged it into hope that people can literally be doing, have a business, um, a, a happier existence. And um, I, I really, really applaud you for all the work, the resilience that you showcased and you are showcasing and uh, I'm going to be expecting an invite to your new um, retreat, you know, so we can <laughs> come and have a, a cuppa and then just talk and maybe we can um, have a live interview so we can hear Sounds what's right. <laughs> now, finally, now, Tisha, I mean, if there's just maybe one single piece of um, hope or a takeaway you'd like our viewers to remember from our conversation today, what, what would that be? I think what I like telling people is that unexpected hurdles will interrupt our life. You know, it's a given, but it's our response to that that will define our life experience. And by using our mindset, we can have an impact on our experience. So try not to take the narrative of other people because who you are dealing with an illness is very different to who someone else is. So, and I often talk about that, you know, I'm the secret ingredient. The person who's also been diagnosed with stage four breast cancer or MS doesn't necessarily have my mindset. So their outcome might be different to mine, you know. So I just want people to know that no matter what happens, you can have an impact on your experience. I think that's powerful. And thank you. And You're ladies welcome. and gentlemen, that about wraps it up for this incredible conversation with the amazing, amazing Tisha Rose right there. And uh, her journey from hurdle to hope is nothing short of inspiring. Just a simple reminder to all of us that our mindset is truly everything you could be lying in bed right now or you could be running around something might just 
come and interrupt that well-being or interrupt that life. Uh, and you never know what that could be. But no matter what it is, they are not going to take your mindset away. And as teacher has mentioned, there's certain things that you can actually start to do immediately in order for you to actually um, have a happier existence. And if you found today's episode as enlightening as I did, be sure to watch it again or share it with a friend who is going through a tough time. As you have um, you know, realized, Tisha is here to help each and every one of us kiss goodbye to everyday stress, anxiety, and fear. And that doesn't necessarily mean you have to be going through any terminal illness or anything of that nature. Each and every one of us is going through our own hurdles and we need hope in order for us to see the other end. So Tisha, thank you once again. You're welcome. It's been lovely, Prosper. I love what you're doing. Um, and yeah, I was very happy to be part of it. Fantastic. And for those that are watching right now, if you want more insightful discussions and empowering stories, don't forget to subscribe to the Online Prosperity Show. Until next time, I want you to keep believing, keep thriving, and keep embracing the journey towards a happier existence. Bye for now.